Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture says, God yearns jealousy for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives us he gives all the more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, are you not a doer of the law but a judge? There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So who then are you to judge your neighbor? This is the word of the Lord. I want you to think with me today about false monotomies. I don't think that's a real word, but we're going to make it one today. It's not in the dictionary today, but it might be this time next year. False monotomies. It sounds like something painful your doctor might do to you, but it's even more insidious and potentially dangerous than that. False monotomies can be as dangerous as false dichotomies. I feel like I've spent much of my life attacking false dichotomies. I've, of, I've often felt like I was a both-and person living in an either-or world. And false dichotomies are those times in which we're forced to make a decision that is really a false choice to begin with. I go to the dessert table and the lady behind the table says, Preston, would you like warm chocolate-covered bread pudding with vanilla ice cream on top? Or would you like warm peach cobbler made from fresh Arkansas peaches with vanilla ice cream on top. Which one would you like? You see what she did to me? She backed me into a corner and forced me into a false choice. You don't have to make that choice. I'll have three of each is what I would like. I'm a both-and person. False dichotomy. I like going around and saying both in an either-or world. I've also thought that on more than one occasion, some of our stick, sticky ethical dilemmas today are the result of people forcing us into pre prescribed camps, either or decisions. You're either pro-choice or pro-life. You can't be both, and if you're not pro-life, you must be pro-death, and if you're not pro-choice, you're pro-force. But you don't have to think about it, you just have to toe the line. You're either one or the other. If you think war is bad, you must hate soldiers because to be pro-war is to be pro-soldier. I often feel like the binaries we live with today, the binaries of our two-party political system, creates some false dichotomies that stunt creative thought, stunt third, third solutions, creative solutions, originality of thought. False dichotomies breathe on the oxygen of binaries where you're either this or you're that and there is no gray area in between. But it seems to me a lot of days that everything down here is all mixed up. It's hard to tell one from the other. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells the parable of the sheep and the goats and how God will go about sorting out the sheep and the goats on that great last day. 
But down here, the sheep and the goats are all, all mixed up. The goats are in the sheep pen, and the sheep are in the goats pen. It's all mixed up. It's not either or, it's both. The, the light and shadows are, are all mixed up in this world. And the brighter the light shines, the darker the shadows around it. Light and shadows are intermingled. And did you know that sitting on your pew today is a real live grade A sinner? You are sitting on the same pew as a sinner. Did you know that? And in your pew, some of you grade A plus sinners are sitting on your pew. <laughs> also sitting on your pew today is a saint. A grade A saint. Maybe a B minus saint. Even if you're the only one sitting in your pew today, there is a sinner and a saint. It's a both and. It's not an either or. That's a false dichotomy. Everything down here is all mixed up and I don't always like it when people back me in a corner and make me, to choo make me have to choose things that seem like a false choice to me. But I've also learned, especially of late, the dangers of false monotomies as well. If a false dichotomy is a choice between two things that are not the opposite, a false monotomy is refusing to choose between two things which are not synonymous with each other. It is to make a false equation in which one thinks they don't have to choose between things that demand a choice. It's to assume the likeness of things that are not alike and the compatibility of things that are not compatible. The great theologian Yogi Berra once said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. But you can't take it. When you decided on whom to marry, you could not say, well, I like him and him and him. I'll have three, please. You, you had to choose. Once, I was doing premarital counseling with a couple and we were talking through all the sticky wickets of marriage, the problems that often crop up in marital relationships. And I got to the place where I said, all right, let's talk about children. And the gentleman said, I want a house full of them. I love kids. I want kids. And the woman said, I don't want kids. And they stared at each other. And normally at this point, I would say, well, let's compromise about this. Let's find a creative third way. But you can't. You can't have half a child. And, and so we had to talk through it. A, a false monotomy occurs when a person refuses to make a choice between things which are not compatible. If you've been paying attention on our journey through James, I'm sure you've noticed that James is full of dichotomies. Not false ones, but true ones. There are a number of either-ors in this book that demand a choice in James' mind. And he keeps saying, you've got to choose, you've got to choose, you've got to choose. James says there are hearers of the Word and doers of the Word. There is a religion that is true and pure and undefiled. It takes care of orphans and widows, the vulnerable. And there is religion that is something other than that. There are churches who play favorites. And there are churches that do not discriminate. There are those who say they have faith. And there are those that act upon their faith. There is a wisdom from above. And there is a wisdom from below. And over and over again in this letter from James, he decries those who think with double minds. Read the book of James on a rainy day and highlight the number of times James uses the phrase double-minded, double-minded, double-minded. James says a lot of folks are walking around with two brains in their heads. Over and over again, James comes back to these dichotomies, these choices that we have to make. Two paths before us that we must choose. And here, it all comes to a culmination in this text when James says, in no uncertain terms, friendship with the world is hostility towards God. And he says it with great force too. Throughout the whole letter, he's called these people brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, so tenderly. Did you hear what he calls them here? Adulteresses. I'm the kind of person who would say, James, you're being too harsh. 
You can't be a friend of God and a friend of the world. I'm a both and person. I want both. That's a false choice. But in the ancient world, friendship was something other than what we think of friendship today. Today we have what we call casual friendships. We have relationships with people that we befriended on Facebook or someone we haven't talked to in 10 years, but we call them friends. We just share some sort of affinity with them or our kids played soccer together eight years ago. But in the ancient world, friendship carried with it deep and abiding affection. And it carried with it a relationship in which two people shared the same mind and the same convictions and the same outlooks. Therefore, to be a friend of the world is to share the outlook of the world, the convictions of the world. And to be a friend of God is to share the outlooks and convictions of God. And these are not the same which is something to which Scripture testifies over and over again. The moment one becomes a friend of God in the Bible, that's precisely the moment their troubles start in this world. We have a number of books in our Bibles that bear the name of certain prophets. But the prophets didn't write the books. The prophets spoke the messages. Their followers, their tribe had to codify their sermons and write them down because the prophets were dead. They killed them. And Jesus, the one we name as the supreme revelation of God in this world, God with us, was crucified by religious and political authorities. They did so because they perceived Him as a threat, someone who was undermining the way they looked at the world and subverting their powers in this world. They killed Him. What does the cross mean to us today if not this, that friendship with the world is enmity towards God and friendship with God is enmity towards the world? This dichotomy isn't just present in, in Jesus' death, but in His life as well. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus describes God's way in the world, how to be God's people, what it looks like to be God's people. And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus sums it up with sort of an old-fashioned invitation. Two ways. He, he has three different images of two ways. First of all, two paths, a narrow and a wide path, you must choose. Which one will you follow? And then two trees, a tree that produces good fruit and a tree that produces bad fruit. And you know the trees by their fruit, and you must choose. And then two foundations, one which is strong and sturdy and withstands the storms of this world, and one which isn't. And you must choose. The message is clear. God's way is an alternative, radically different way in this world. And we have to choose one or the other. You can hear it in the parable of the sower as well, which we read earlier in this service. The farmer, whom Jesus later identifies as the father, is out sowing the seed, sowing his word on all types of soil, all types of people. Some people are shallow and the, the seed sprouts with vigor and life, vitality, but because the soil is shallow, it does not last long. The yes doesn't make it past tomorrow. Some people are like rocky ground. That the seed can't take root and it's gobbled up by birds before it has a chance to even be heard. Some people are like good soil and God's Word takes root deep within them and produces a surprisingly miraculous crop. But I'd like for us to focus today on the third kind of soil. I skipped it earlier. The, the soil with the thorns and the weeds in it. Did you hear that part of the parable? The soil is good enough and the soil is rich enough. The problem isn't that the soil doesn't have enough depth or nutrients in it. The problem is that the soil has too much in it. And as the seed sprouts, as the plant grows, so do the thorns and the, the thistles within it. And eventually the weed chokes the seed. A few, weeks, a few weekends ago... I walked outside after one of the heavy rains we've had and I saw that there was a weed growing through one of our azalea bushes at our house. And by weed, I mean this was a major league weed. It had a full-fledged stalk and it grew up sort of camouflaged as if it was the plant. And as I looked, the, if you looked from a distance, 
The weed looked like it was the plant, and the azalea looked like it was the weed, and the weed had grown fingers around the branches of the azalea. And I looked and I thought, it's all one thing. But then I began to pull up the weed, and for a second, if you looked from a distance, it would look like I was pulling up the whole plant because it was all intertwined and wrapped together, and it looked like one thing, but it wasn't one thing. It's funny how weeds and plants can get intertwined over time. And I guess what I'm really trying to say to you today is, heart to heart, it's funny how weeds and seeds can get intertwined over time. They become a false monotony, as if they're one thing, but they're not one thing. They're two separate things. God's Word and God's way begins to take root in some of us. It's not that we don't say yes to God. We say yes to God, but we say yes to so many other things. And all those yeses grow up together as if they're one thing, but they're not one thing. And they're all intertwined. And it's difficult to tell one from another. Brothers and sisters, can we be honest with one another today? In our most generous spirits, in our most humble hearts, can we be honest with one another today? For centuries, the gospel of Jesus Christ has become intertwined with other gospels. And for centuries, people have assumed that the way of Jesus and these other ways were all one and the same thing. Because they all grew up together, they grew out of the same soil, and they were all wrapped up together. And to begin pulling at one makes people think you're pulling the, pulling the bush up. For centuries, we've assumed things are one and they are not one. For centuries, and I mean this for centuries, Western Europeans assumed that being white was good and virtuous. Included in the mission's efforts of the church were missionaries sent to distant and foreign lands, explorers sent to distant and faraway places in the hopes of plundering, subjugating, and oftentimes enslaving people. Most often they did so with the formal and clear blessing of the church. Go and do in the name of Jesus. We have correspondence that names it. Perhaps this is best summarized by the South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu who said, when the missionaries came to Africa, we had the land and they had the Bibles. And they said, let us pray. And we closed our eyes. And when we opened up our eyes, we had the Bibles and they had the land. And in this country, white supremacy was the core belief which allowed us to annihilate one people and enslave another, and do so with a clear conscience. Because we believed in the supremacy of the white race. This was a white man's country. Let's be honest about that. It was a white man's country, which means what was good for this country is what was good for a white man. The Declaration of Independence states, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. But wouldn't we have to confess today that when we wrote it, we didn't believe that all meant all? Wouldn't the women in the room know that? Wouldn't the folks in our society who aren't white know that? Some people were not equal. What I'm saying to you today is the spread of the Christian gospel and the spread of white supremacy and imperialism was all wound up together and it was the same for centuries. And when you begin to pull at the weed, it looks like you're pulling at the plant. In the South, where there was an economic incentive for slavery, the entanglement between white supremacy and the Christian faith was even more pronounced. We justified slavery buttressed by the Bible. Slaves, obey your masters as to the Lord, Paul says. Where's the confusion in that? It's in the good book. Slaves, obey your masters. And in 1845, the Baptists in this country split north to south, and the lone reason, the lone reason was slavery. Think about that. Baptists split 
Because the weed and the plant were all caught up in one thing and nobody could tell the difference. It's where Southern Baptists came from. It's where our forefathers and foremothers came from. It's the tradition in which this church was born. In fact, people subconsciously, on a denominational level, on a personal level, assumed that two things were one. Brothers and sisters, the church has done as much to promulgate racism in this country as anybody. My hope and prayer is that in the future we'll do as much to end it as anybody. Because the two are not one. And nationalism. Christian people in this country have long used biblical imagery to describe our country. A city on a hill. A Christian nation. A holy people. In many people's minds, American exceptionalism and the cosmic kingdom of God are, are one and the same thing. When they say one, they think the other. And when they say the other, they think the first. Our baptismal vow and our social security number pretty much mean the same thing to these folks. It reminds me of in the Old Testament, the Canaanite gods, where the people believed that gods were territorial. This god was God here, and this god was God here, and this god was God here. And the people of Israel bought into that in their early days. They believed that Yahweh was the God of Israel. And when they said that, that's what they meant. Yahweh was the God of Israel. But then they were sent off into exile which is part of what made exile so traumatic for them. They were leaving Israel, and therefore they thought they were leaving Yahweh. They had no God. But when they arrived in Babylon, they discovered that Yahweh was not the God of Israel. Read the end of Isaiah. Yahweh is not the God of Israel. Yahweh is the God of all creation and all people, and there is no other. It's so easy, brothers and sisters, for us to shrink the God of all nations and all peoples down to an idol, a nationalistic God. And it's so very easy for the church just to become a chaplain for our nation, our state, and it feels good. But it's not who our God is. Our God is the God of all people in all places. As one of my favorite preachers once said, one of the challenges of the church today is to keep reminding people that God and country is not one word. There's a difference between the two. A and money. Some people link up the Christian faith with money. It's all one and the same. We see it so very clearly in the health and wealth gospel, the name it and claim it, that God wants you to be rich. We see wealth as a sign of God's blessing. And the corollary belief, poverty is a sign of God's cursing, which is how we go about even subconsciously saying wealthy people are virtuous and poor people are sinners. We've heard it so much, we can't tell the difference between seed and weed. Brothers and sisters, following Jesus and following money will never take us to the same place. Following Jesus and following the money will never take us to the same place. And one takes us to the kingdom of God. But we have allowed these two ideas to grow together for centuries, and when you begin to tug at the weed, people think, hey, you're messing with my plant. But what I'm saying to you today, pastor and people, and heart to heart, I hope, is that we've got some disentangling to do before us. And we'll either find life in doing that, we'll find the potency of the gospel, we'll find the radical nature of Jesus' way in doing so, or we'll discover the death of not doing it. For centuries, we have all, me included, tried to do life God's way and the world's way. I have tried to be a friend with God and with the world. I've tried to come to the fork in the road between God's way and the world's way, and where it diverged, I've tried to take it. But you can't take it. Violence and war and genocide and suppression have all been done in Jesus' name, and James says this must not be. 
And Jesus says, this must not be. These things are false monotonies to be confessed, not praised. Every Sunday, I stand up here and preach what we call the gospel, or at least I try to. The word gospel means good news. So every, every Sunday, I stand up here and try to preach good news to you. And yet, we open up a book where the documents are at least two millennia old. I'm guessing the text Lydia read today from the book of James is the oldest thing you'll encounter until next week when we gather in this room and read from this book. It's old stuff. How can we possibly call it new if it's so old? It's not chronology that makes the good news news. It's not chronology. It's uniqueness. The gospel is new, y'all, because it's different. It's different than anything you've ever heard anywhere else you've gone. It is different news. The gospel is news because it's radical, because it's subversive, because it's an alternative way. It's the story which calls all other stories into question. It is eternally and everlastingly news. And we are called to bear that news everywhere we go and make disciples. But before we can bear that news, we have to believe it. And before we can believe it, we have to disentangle some things so that we know what the it is that we believe. Part of me thinks we've wrapped the potency of the gospel and all this other stuff because we recognize the gospel is so potent and powerful. We wanted to tame it. We have to remember what it is we said yes to when we were baptized. Can I ask you today, what is it that you said yes to when you were baptized? And what were you baptized into? And it's from that yes that we will determine all of our other no's. No to racism. No to sexism. No to violence. No to death. No to all the other isms and phobias. Not because we're New Age or conservative or liberal or Republican or Democrat or popular or traditional. No. But because of the yes we said before we were plunged into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Before we pledged to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. And if we do, we will experience the news that is really, really good, like life-changing, society-saving news. And it really is new as well, because nobody's ever heard or seen anything like it. This might be a good place to begin. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, James says, therefore, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Take a posture of repentance. Humble yourselves before God and He will exalt you. In a moment, we're going to come to the table. But before we do, we thought we would have a prayer of confession this morning to do some soul searching, to take on a posture of repentance as people. So I would encourage you to join me in this prayer and let this prayer be that which leads us to the table today. Would you join me? I'll, I'm in the fine print if you'll join me in the bold. Oh Lord, we confess to you our sins today in the hopes that you will make us new and square our gaze solely upon you. We confess the times we have followed other lords in other ways. Forgive us and make us new. We confess the times we have named you as our Lord, but our lives confessed another. Forgive us 
and make us new. We confess the times we have allowed other stories to divert our ears from your story. Forgive us and make us new. We confess the times we have been silent in the face of oppression and injustice. Forgive us and make us new. We confess the times we lack the loyalty and the courage to be your people. Forgive us and make us new. We confess the times we used the faith to further our agendas. Forgive us and make us new. We confess the times we have raised our hands to worship you while we clench them against our neighbor. Forgive us and make us new. O oh Lord, we know that you are in the process of making all things new. We want to participate with you in that work. We know that will likely make us new. And so we pray that you will forgive us and make us new.